The views expressed on the following program do not necessarily reflect the views of Money Radio staff, management, or advertisers, and do not represent an offer to buy or sell any securities. Some interviews heard on this program may be sponsored by the participants. It's time for Health Futures with Cypress Home Care Solutions, Bob Roth. This is Arizona's only show dedicated to providing you with expert advice on how to live a longer, healthier, and happier life. To learn more, call 602-264-8009. That's 602-264-8009. Now, here's your host, Bob Roth. Good afternoon. You're listening to Health Futures, taking stock in you. And if you're accustomed to listening to this show, it must be Friday. And indeed it is. It is Friday, June 26, 2020, and it is the last Friday of June. Where does the time go? In COVID time, it is just absolutely flying by. Uh, If you are tuning in for the very, very first time, Health Futures is a show about how our older adult population can live a healthier, happier life. And how do we do this? We do this by bringing extraordinary guests to the show. And they're the ones that make the show. It's not really me. I ask the tough questions, and they respond and give you, our listeners, some great information about how to do just that, how to live a healthier, happier life. And I'm proud to have a repeat guest. Uh, It's been almost four years since she's been on my studio here. We're coming at you live from the Scottsdale Air Park Money Radio Studio, and I have got Senator Kate Brophy-McGee here in the studio. Welcome back, Kate. Thank you, Bob. It's just wonderful to be back and hear what you have to say. Honored to be your guest. Well, I'm glad to have you here, and just so much is going on. Uh, You know, ever since this pandemic hit and our state took uh, the stay-at-home orders, and now coming out, um, there's just a lot of a lot of discussions, a lot of things to talk about. There's a lot of misinformation out there, and there's a lot of good information out there as well. But I want to really start off by saying, look, you're a senator here. You've been in politics for a little while. I want our listeners to know a little bit about you because I believe you were born and raised local. You're from Arizona. Your family's deeply rooted here. I would love to know a little bit about your background and why did you decide to get into public office? Well, thank you for asking. I'm a third generation Arizonan and um, yes, I do have a relation to the Brophy Prep. People always ask me that. That was built uh, by my great uncle's side of the family. But I've been in public service for 20 years. I served the first 10 years on the Washington Elementary School Board and that in turn led to now 10 years in the legislature, the last four in the Senate. And the purpose for me serving and doing this is the opportunity to do good. Whether it's the complete reform and establishment of the Department of Child Safety, whether it's healthcare legislation related to breast cancer, I have a lot of bills and initiatives that, that I've worked on over the past 10 years that say, this is what I love to do, and this is what I'm good at, and I'm just so honored to be able to do it. Well, I think, too, and I, and I know this about you, it's, it's, it's your passion. It's not a job. This is what you do. And, and the fact is is that you're, you're an advocate of health care, and you're an advocate of education, and it makes a lot of sense. And you're also you know, the chair for the Health and Human Services for the Senate, and you oversee all the bills that come in for those areas. Um, yeah, yeah, I do. I Early on, I figured out that how we define ourselves as a state is by how we treat and respect our most vulnerable populations. And I really have gravitated to working with the elderly, Uh, with children who are in the custody of the state, with mentally ill, with people with health problems, and uh, I found great, great purpose in pushing forward Arizona policies that really benefit these populations. 
Love it. I, I, I love what you're doing, and you and I have gotten a chance to get to know one another really over the last, call it, you know, 10 years since you've Ten been, years. You, you've been in, in government, and, you know, we've been trying in the home care space to try to not so much regulate it because I'm not a really big regulation person, but more about protecting one of our most vulnerable populations, and that is our seniors. And I remember one of the first initiatives I worked on with you was home care workers, non-medical, right, going into someone's home, doing very personal, intimate tasks, whether it's helping them bathe or whether it's helping them write checks. The, you, we had to have some controls and some consumer choices in that arena, and it was, it was a really tough initiative because Arizona is an anti-regulation state. Uh, I still feel there is more work we can do there, but I'm glad that companies like yours were able to distinguish themselves to people calling, looking for someone they can trust to take care of their loved one. Exactly. And, and we did, you know, get a bill in place, and that was yep. in 2015. And, and basically, it's more of a disclosure bill. Yep. And, you know, maybe we can revisit it in, in another session in, in next year or years to come to put a little more teeth to it. But we want consumers to really be aware. And there, unfortunately, are a lot of bad actors out there. And that's the thing that we want to protect our older, most one of our most vulnerable populations from. Well, you were the first to bring it really front and center to my attention. And Another phrase I learned working with you was silver tsunami. Right. Arizona has a rapidly, exponentially expanding elder, pop elder population, and we need to continue to focus on developing policies in advance of a problem uh, that will ensure that their needs are met and that they are kept safe. Well, one, one of the things I've learned about you, we were just talking before – our show got started. Not only do you chair the health and human service side of the Senate, but you also co-chair the Department for Child Safety, and you're very involved in education and higher education for workforce development. And I will tell you, and you've heard me talk about this, we have a sh severe shortage of workforce in the care space, and we have to address this. And and the other part, and I know you heard from me and some of my colleagues in this past year, is a livable wage. And especially for the Altex providers, um, we have not been able to really keep up with the minimum wage increases to be paying an adequate amount to our care workers. And that's something that I know our session ended early this year, but I know my team members and my colleagues will be back talking to you and some of your colleagues to try to see what we can do to get more income into the all tax budget so that we can take care of these workers and pay them a livable wage. I, can't, I couldn't agree with you more. We had succeeded over this past session before it ended so abruptly. And while we had money, we had put together a coalition that was addressing that all aspects of that critical workforce. Sure. That workforce was having difficulties, were having difficulties hiring and retaining even before the pandemic hit. And then as the pandemic ha hit, it I think has even made the situation more critical. So it needs to be front and center in whatever we do. I'm grateful we were able to um, work out an increase for providers through DES but that's not the end. Right. That's the start. And, and DES, for our listeners, it's primarily for the developmentally disabled population, which includes a lot of children. And, and yep. we're talking about the elderly and physically yes. disabled. But we can talk more about that and many other things. That music tells us we're down one segment. Okay. You've been listening to Health Futures Taking Stock and You. I've got Senator Kate Brophy McGee here in the studio. Stick around. We'll be right back. Now back to Health Futures, taking stock in you. If you have questions about your own or your loved one's future health care, call 602-264-8009. Now, here's your host, 
Cypress Home Care Solutions, Bob Roth. Welcome back. You're listening to Health Futures Taking Stock in You. And it is Friday, June 26. We're coming at you live from the Scottsdale Air Park. And I've got Senator Kate Brophy McGee here in the studio. And if you missed our first segment, you can catch it right up on our website at cypresshomecare.com. Click on the media button. Third button down is radio show. You can catch this and about 300 others that we've been bringing to you for the last seven and a half years. So when we were talking in the first segment, we talked a little bit about uh, Senator Brophy McGee's experience in why she got into public service and what her background was. Um, we also talked a little bit about some of the legislative efforts that have been going on and, and some of the, the positions that she occupies in the legislature, one being the chair of the Health and Human Services group or committee. Uh, she's also co-chair for the Department of Child Safety, and she is involved in education and higher education for the workforce development. And that's kind of where we left off. We were talking about workforce development. And, you know, you and I talked before we even, you know, kicked off the show and you brought it up during the first segment is that we have a, a severe aging population here in Arizona. And we have to figure out how to care for so many um, that are turning 65 and much older. Uh, in Arizona, by 2030, we're going to have more people 65 and older than 18 and younger. And that's a first for our state, let alone in yep. the country. It's going to happen a few years after that. So uh, we, we've got our work cut out for us. Um, we also talked about a livable wage uh, for the workforce. And you've been very instrumental to uh, help us. Uh, you, you mentioned that you were working with the developmentally disabled right. uh, division of DES and got some stuff accomplished there. And we're looking for getting some stuff accomplished with the elderly and physically disabled population as well. Um, these are different times. Um, I do want to mention uh, you sponsored a bill to keep the Governor's Advisory Council on Aging going. And I, I'm proud to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, affording us to not sunset but to continue on because we have so much work to do. It was one of the few bills to actually make it out of a very abbreviated cut short session and I cannot compliment Lisa O'Neill, your board chair, enough. You, She cares so deeply about this issue. She had so much in-depth knowledge. Um, I think where we have moved it to the Governor's Office of Youth, Faith, and Family gives it an attachment and a launching place to really take all the good work that they have done and and really integrate it into our policy making our decision making i serve on three i think they have nine councils or 13 councils. anyway i serve on three of the governor's office youth faith and family councils the commission to prevent violence against women i'm the co-chair of that Angela Ducey's uh, Oversight Committee, Family Empowerment, Child Safety Committee, and also Cindy McCain's Human Trafficking uh, Council. So I serve on those, and I see the good work that we can do uh, and the path to legislation and to policy and overall education of people in the communities about how important this issue is. Thank you. It's so important to shine a light on all of these issues, and especially when they're affecting vulnerable populations, Correct. and they need advocates. They need advocates like you and, and so many that are stepping up and volunteering not only their time, but making a difference. And, and I do want to say one of the things that I am really feeling really good about what we accomplished over the last couple of years with the Governor's Advisory Council on Aging is we have this community and legislative partners on aging group. Uh, it used to be called Senior Caucus, and it's so nice that we get a lot of your colleagues that are part of that, and uh, uh, Senator Carter is uh, very active in that, um, as well as many of the others, and we talk about real relevant issues, and we bring forth the leaders in our community, and not only shining a light on the issues, but helping to problem solve, and that's really what we need to do. We have a lot of problem solving we need to do. Well, I want to give a shout out to Senator Heather Carter and also to Senator Leela Alston. They've formed a bipartisan council on aging. One of the things that we run into down at the legislature are silos. And people, when they're dealing with government agencies, run into the problem of silos. So if you can break down those silos and 
have the information and the resources flowing back and forth between the legislators, which are the policy makers and the funders, and then the points of expertise, like the Governor's Council on Aging, you can really develop articulated policies and a holistic approach to very complex problems. And one of the things that Senator Carter has been doing is really breaking down and drilling into workforce issues related to care, caring for our aging. So we need to do a lot more. We need to, and we need to shine the light, and we also need to be able to come up with some really good solutions. And we can only do that together. We can't do that in those silos that you were talking right. about. You know, um, you, you are in election year. And I know in Arizona, and it's very different in different states. I, I grew up, you, you talked about you know, being third generation here. I'm, I'm from Maryland originally, but I've lived here for a long time. I've been here 26 years and been coming here for almost 35 years. But uh, every year, every two years, you have to run again. And that's, that's going to be challenging because, you know, like anything else, it takes a lot of energy, it takes a lot of money, um, but, you know, it, it takes a lot of support. So, so far, you've received endorsements from the Arizona Medical Association and the Arizona Nurses Association. What are you hearing from the medical professions as it relates to what we're experiencing right now with COVID and this pandemic? So, I am in constant touch with uh, doctors, with hospitals, and with healthcare providers. Um, the system is under extreme stress. Uh, because this has been a prolonged pandemic, we're having another spike. But I, one of the reasons I love working with this community so much is they are collectively and individually problem solvers. They don't show up to complain. <laughs> they don't call. They, they get they get together to solve problems, and it's very much kind of like the work I used to do on my school board, where you just you have a problem and you've got to solve it. Right. So. I have been following very closely the developments in the pandemic. Uh, we did slow the spread. We did develop capacity. Uh, and uh, But there are some things we could have done better. And even as we're making our way through this pandemic, I think there's also a look back or look backs that we are all doing to see what do we need to have in place? What could we have done better? You know, it's interesting. Uh, there's so much that we've learned. And, you know, they, they talk about a, uh, a second wave uh, possibly in the fall or winter. But truly, that second wave is more conducive for other places other than Arizona because they're talking about, you know, northeast country uh, states and Midwest states because when you're outdoors, it doesn't spread. It's when you're in closed con confines. Well, in Arizona, we're all indoors right now. <laughs> because it's going to be 108 degrees. So part and parcel of our numbers going up is the fact that, you know, many of us are indoors. Now, you know, we, we can also talk about the fact that maybe we opened up a little too soon and, and maybe we're, we're, you know, we're, we're not adhering to the safety measures that should be followed, you know, masks versus no masks. Uh, but, you know, we're here. And, you know, w we can all be Monday morning quarterbacks. And we can talk about what we didn't do right. But from here on, we can be in control of our destiny. And that's what I'd like to impart to our listeners and, and have you feel, you know, the, the opportunity to share that with our listeners, too. I mean, we're in control. Uh, we're not going to let this virus beat us. Um, we, can, we can beat this virus, but we have to do certain things to be able to do that. You're absolutely right. And I think leadership is crucial. I have any number of my colleagues that are running around like chicken little and squawking about the sky falling but the fact of the matter is as leaders we can stand up we can set examples we can drill down into the numbers get a better understanding again looking at those who are working on this issue uh, from the ninth floor to the hospital cadre to the medicaid providers to the health care providers everybody is totally focused on containing and overcoming this virus. Uh, we have some enormous spikes in uh, Santa Cruz and Yuma counties, and we have been dealing with uh, in 
uh, Navajo County, we've been dealing with some enormous spikes. And to some extent, plus the increased testing, they've skewed our numbers. But there is no doubt that we are having more cases of COVID, and we need to get a handle on this now. I was very happy to see the governor step up and say this is what we have to do. So was I. Uh, you know, I, I wish that had happened maybe sooner, but like I said, we can't go backwards. We can always go forward. And one of the things I think this virus and this pandemic has shined a light on is the fact that Americans were not really healthy. And if you look at the populations that have been most affected by this, you know, those that have morbidities, comorbidities, you know, that have, you know, underlying health conditions and, you know, smoking and obesity and, you know, you know, just diabetes, you know, diabetes yeah. and, and not exercising. I mean, you know, Dr. David Katz, who's an epidemiologist who said, you know, if there's anything that we take away from this is that while we are staying at home, while we are protecting our loved ones in our community, we should be focusing on eating better, physically exercising and taking care of ourselves because this thing takes down people that are not healthy and they haven't been taking care of themselves. And we also are uh, dealing, well, just a, a side note, another piece of what I've been hearing besides these illnesses and hospitalization and death is the cry from small businesses. We have to open it up. Yeah. But uh, we can also talk about our kids who are 10 feet tall and bulletproof they need to recognize their role as asymptomatic spreaders. When we come back, we're going to talk about both small businesses and opening up and these kids that are these spreaders. You've been listening to Health Futures, taking stock in you. We'll be right back. As we reach the bottom of the hour, we pause for a look at the world's news. Then we're back with Money Talk, where Money Radio 1510 AM and 105.3 FM. Now back to Health Futures, taking stock in you. If you have questions about your own or your loved one's future health care, call 602-264-8009. Now, here's your host, Cypress Home Care Solutions, Bob Roth. Welcome back. You're listening to Health Futures, taking stock in you. And if you're just tuning in, we're in our second half year, and I've got Senator Kate Brophy McGee here in the studio, and... We've been talking about a lot of different things, but obviously the biggest topic of on hand right now is this pandemic. And if you missed the first half, I urge you to go out to our website at cypresshomecare.com. Click on the media button. Third button down is radio show. You'll catch this first half and about 300 others that we've been bringing to you for the last seven and a half years. So, Kate, we talked about a lot of things in that first half, but, you know, I really want to focus in on two things that we talked about as we closed that first half and that was we talked about the effects of this shutdown that we went through for you know that part of March all the way up to the very beginning of May Um, you know small businesses I mean they have been affected tremendously I mean they are seeing you know losses in revenue and income not every one of them could qualify to get PPP I mean I I look at my barber and he's a he's an entrepreneur he's a Russian immigrant came here uh, opened up his shop about 14 years ago and I said to him when things opened up and I went and got a haircut and he wears a mask and I wear a mask and that's a topic we can talk about later about masks but um, I asked him I said did you get any PPP he goes I couldn't I said what do you mean he goes my employees are really not employees. They're contractors. And he, he was left out, and he, he was completely shut down. And there has got to be a lot of others out there that just felt like they couldn't qualify or didn't know how to qualify and, and have really struggled. So I, I'm glad that we've opened up. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm really concerned about some of the smaller businesses that you know, are really constrained and seeing capacity at maybe 25 percent like restaurants aren't supposed to be opening up all their entire place so i i know that you know you brought it up i you know, i'd love to hear your points of view on that and then we can talk about the spreaders the vectors out there okay i've been doing a lot of work with individuals constituents uh, and businesses in my district uh, relating to access to unemployment now these individual or independent contractors like your barber may qualify for the 
pandemic unemployment assistance because while they wouldn't qualify under typical Arizona statute standards, they do apply and could apply and qualify for the $600 pandemic uh, relief. And I have helped a lot of folks get onto that who were gig workers, salon, uh, nail techs, those types of folks who uh, qualify for that when they wouldn't typically qualify. So you should probably give me your barber's name and I'll try and help them. Yeah, please do. Um, as far as small business goes, uh, the there was there were a number of loan programs that were addressed in the original CARES Act and then in a follow-up CARES Act. And working with small businesses, Local First, uh, Arizona Small Business Association, we've been able to guide many of these folks to those loans. Uh, and, they're, and then the city of Phoenix, as an example, has been providing loans to small businesses. And they're also through Local First, micro-targeted loan programs. It, and they really are aimed at those businesses where it's mom and pop, gross revenues, 40000 a year, but that's their business. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, there have been some really good programs out there, although they initially did not roll out well. So between unemployment assistance and small business assistance, it's been really busy. I will tell you that small business owners are saying we have to open up or we're gone. Yeah, they, I, I mean, I, I want to cry. I mean, some of these guys, you there, know, they. Yeah, there are spikes in suicides, mm. spikes in overdose, yeah. alcoholism, uh, all the things that we're seeing, uh, the prolonged impact of depriving someone of their purpose and their livelihood is like a financial virus it, it really hurts them it does and you know the other thing and and i know that this is one of your passions you talked about it when we first kicked off our show in the first segment is education you were on the board of the washington school district you know these kids that just graduated these you know pandemic coronavirus graduations that never really did happen for high school and for college you know, I don't know if we're ever going to really realize the effects of this till I maybe years to come. I mean, you know, the, yeah. the, you know, we, we try to coddle them. We try to tell them that they're special, but so many of them didn't get closure. I mean, you think about when the shutdowns went across the country. You know, I, I'm a big podcaster, and I, I was listening to the New York Times, The Daily, and they they did a profile on, on this one woman that was going to school at Haverford, and she was you know basically her 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 mother and father you know operated a small small business and you know she couldn't afford to go to college and she got a scholarship and here she was a senior and you know was on spring break like many of those college kids were and when they came back they said get your stuff go you're home. going home and mm -hmm. you know she was a senior and, and never got to graduate never got closure so you know, I, you talk about lemons and lemonade. I saw so many creative approaches in my district. Me too. I went to a semi-virtual graduation for Sunny Slope High School seniors. We ha held it outside. We socially distanced, and they did a huge mural class of 2020, and the students had a little march, and the elected, it's like me, gave them hurrah and a send-off uh, but it also has exposed some real weaknesses in our education system. Back in 2000 through 2006, I was on the Arizona School Facilities Board, and our total focus was broadband to rural and underserved areas. And here we are in 2020, and we still don't have it right. So going back to the legislature, that broadband access in underserved urban areas and rural areas has, is a problem we must solve immediately. And I, it's on Governor Ducey's list, priorities list, and that's uh, something we've got to get done so we can be sure these kids can be educated at home under these circumstances or in school. Well, more than likely, we may see this happen again in the fall, so we need to fix this now. Yep. I mean, we have a shortage of laptops, notebooks, you know, computers to get to these kids. Um, yeah, we have to fix this. Um, yeah. the, the, this is the generation. I mean, you and I, we're kind of like, you know, we've lived our lives. This generation is the one that's going to run our, 
our societies and our communities and our economies. Uh, we, we need to make sure they're fortified with all the tools and the, and the learnings that they need, the foundation to be able to be I, those, fo those, those change agents. Every chance I get, I invite high school kids, come down and shadow me, spend, or young professionals, come and spend the day with me. And I always say, you're going to inherit this mess. You better <laughs> learn what it is we do and how we do it. And I am happy to mentor and teach. Um, but I do think um, everybody in the education world has stepped up their game. I am. I really want to give a shout out to Governor Ducey and his collaborative bipartisan approach with Superintendent Kathy Hoffman, who is a Democrat, and they have worked together very closely throughout this entire pandemic. I love it. I yeah. love it. And and you know what? There's still more work to be done. Like you said, uh, you know. We, we discovered the chinks in the armor in not only the, our education system, but we also discovered it in our long-term care facilities and, you know, our, our, some of our most vulnerable. You know, as we close this third segment, it's hard to believe time does fly really fast. Um, you know, I, I, I know with the long-term care facilities, um, we're learning a lot more, um, but we have to make them safe for our older adults to be there. Uh, my aunt, who's... 95 years old she is in a long-term care facility in hamden connecticut and basically she looks at four walls she sees a home health aide maybe three times a week to help her with bathing and 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 dressing and other personal care needs so but remind me about telemedicine and remind me about our covid emergency response to put a little bit of light on this long dark road we've been on all right well you got it You've been listening to Health Futures, taking stock in you. I've got Senator Kate Brophy McGee here in the studio. It is an election year. If they anybody wants to learn more about your platform, where, where do they go? Kate at uh, katemcgee.com, www.katemcgee.com. Katemcgee.com. You've been listening to Health Futures, taking stock in you. We're down three. we got one more to go. Stick around. We'll be right back. Now back to Health Futures, taking stock in you. If you have questions about your own or your loved one's future health care, call 602-264-8009. Now, here's your host, Cypress Home Care Solutions, Bob Roth. Welcome back. You're listening to Health Futures, taking stock in you. And if you're just tuning in, we're in our fourth segment. I've got Senator Brophy McGee here in the studio, and we have been talking a lot about healthcare, education, a whole cadre of stuff. So please go up to our website if you missed those first three segments, cypresshomecare.com. Click on the media button. Third button down is radio show, and you'll catch those first three segments and many, many more. So, Kate. We talked in the third segment, we left off talking about, you know, we gave a little tease for our audience, talking about telemedicine and really uh, the COVID response too. I wanna talk about both. Um, I've had doctors here uh, have, who have told me that they've had to go to telemedicine and weren't doing telemedicine and how eye-opening it was and how they were able to see their patients. I would love to hear uh, what you're learning and and really some of the stuff that maybe you are doing down the legislature relative to telemedicine. So this past session we expanded telemedicine across the board across the state that was uh, Senator Carter's bill. This session as the pandemic came upon us and that same healthcare community the problem solvers jumped together jumped in together and really figured out what problems they needed to solve first and foremost was enhancing and providing telemedicine services in lieu of inpatient appointments. Now, you're never going to replace periodic inpatient appointments. You've got to be able to put eyes on and really see the patient up close, talk to them closely, but what, or, or some of the doctors have said, get their hands on them. Yeah, you know, they, they I like wasn't going to gonna say it, but, but it's also in the Department of Child Safety. You need to see those children right. up close and those families and work with those families very closely. But there is a real place going forward for telemedicine, and that has to do with well checks. Are they taking their medication? Periodic check-in with the doctors. The Medicaid programs have been much more adaptive here in the state. We, I think, continue to struggle with... The Medicare provisions for reimbursement as relates to 
video tele- telephone calls, which is maybe a little big of an ask for elderly mm-hmm. patients, versus telephone calls, which don't produce uh, maybe the needed data. But it is a real bright and shining star uh, for us going forward, and I think for the nation as a whole, it's just pulled us into the 21st century. This is a very useful tool for us. No, it is. And, and you know, there's a lot of good that has come out of this pandemic, and that is something that is really good. Um, being able to stay on top of patients, uh, you know, I had a physician in here telling me that, you know, he has coaches that work for him, uh, healthcare coaches that can communicate and, 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 and get them on a Zoom call or, or some type of conference call. Medicare has been really lax in the type of platforms. So, you know, you can use Zoom, you can use Google Meet, you can use many different platforms and still be able to submit your bill to Medicare or the managed care programs. And they've also, um, they, they've also increased the reimbursement, which was a real challenge for them, too. And that was why that was a, a lo- struggle. Yeah, a lot of them <laughs> didn't do it because they were going to get such, you know, they were going to get such a haircut on it that it just didn't make sense. So I think it was a win-win all the way around. And I'm hoping it'll be a plan we continue going forward as an enhancement of medicine and doctor-patient contact. And, you know, you mentioned Medicaid, and my my hat's off to uh, Jamie Snyder. Yes. And and I've known Jamie, who is head of Medicaid here, head of access for us. Um, I've known her for a long time. And uh, I love her, her brain, her ingenuity, uh, really, you know, looking to innovation. Um, and some of the things that you talked about and others, I know that she and her team are looking at. And I've been working closely with uh, Jamie Snyder. She's, she's an excellent leader, and she's got a great team. Um, and I think at the end of the day, we can make it better for Arizonans with the help from the monetary help from the federal government with the outstanding management. No, no doubt, no doubt. So you also left a tease about COVID response, the COVID-19 response here. So one of the things we got out of the my continuation bill for the Department of Health Services, when the pandemic hit, it was waiting for a committee hearing in the House, and they pulled it forward and put it onto the House floor and added $55 million to it from the Rainy Day Fund to fund COVID-related responses. One of the funding sources that indirectly came out of that was the reestablishment of the 211 warm line. Yes. And that had been missing for a long time. When the bill came back for my concurrence, uh, my plea on the floor of the Senate was for us to really focus on elder care, skilled nursing facilities, long-term care facilities, and really focus on putting a firewall around those individuals because of their vulnerabilities. And I think going forward into the into whatever this next round of pandemic is going to bring, we must do that. And that includes making sure that the workforce is there, that they have the adequate protections, PPE, that they have childcare so that they can go to work in these high risk jobs and leave their children and and be reimbursed for that. Um, I'm really appreciative that the governor stepped up with a fund on uh, PPE, for instance, that because the Trump administration, um, it it didn't work. He gave it back to the states. So mm-hmm. uh, we, but we need to enhance the PPE. We do. We need to enhance the PPE, and I and I love the fact that we're looking to protect those in the long-term care facilities. And you being involved in workforce, one of the things that we're looking for on the elderly and physically disabled group, it, uh, part of Altex, and we're also looking for it on on the just general caregiving side is enhanced pay. Yes. And you know, some call it you know maybe hero pay. Uh, some people may call it hazard pay, but We've got some frontline workers that are really putting their lives and their families' lives at risk, and we we have to protect them. And so um, I started out the show talking about the DDD funding, uh, provider funding. We have to extend that funding to include all the workforce for all of these vulnerable populations. Um, The governor has made them a priority for COVID testing. That's good. That needs to happen. Absolutely. Um, 
but there, there are many things we need to do for this population. They were already stressed. This workforce was already stressed before the pandemic hit. And uh, I, I'm, I was happy to see yesterday also that the governor extended the qualified immunities uh, for caregivers. And, and thank you. That was one of the things I wanted to bring up was the qualified immunities yeah. for the caregivers. Yeah. I, I do want to share, and you shared with me the breaking news. Uh, we do have some breaking news that just reported today um, at a Mesa. Um, it, it came across a, at the top of the hour that uh, that one of the hospitals, uh, Banner Desert, um, they have moved to uh, the surge. Right. So, uh, you know, it's concerning. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're live and, and certainly wanted to share that with our listeners. It's important to note where we started versus where we are now. Right. We stopped and shut down so hospitals and care centers could figure this out and put the procedures in place uh, under great hardship and duress for everyone. We did that. Now we're going, having to operationalize these plans because of the surge. Um, but we also, we have more beds at St. Luke. We're better prepared. We are better. I you, just don't want to see a surge. No, I don't <laughs> want to see a surge either. But you mentioned St. Luke's. Uh, we have a hospital that was shut down less than two years ago. It has been prepared. It's ready. Uh, if we need it, it's there. Yep. Yeah, with that, I you know we're almost done here. I want to give a shameless plug to you and your upcoming election. If people wanted to find out more about your platform and what you're doing for your constituents, you want to go to? Kate McGee, M-C-G-E-E dot com. And there's a donate button up there, correct? Correct. Uh, well, I want to and see. And a volunteer. And, and a volunteer. <laughs> we need both. Yes. But I want to see, you know, more of our people activate. I'd love to see you in another session and many sessions to come. You are a big advocate for the older adult population. I am going to contribute to your campaign here today. Take care. Thank you for being on the show. We'll be back next week. Thank you, Bob. There's no place like home. You've been listening to Bob Roth's Health Futures. If you have questions about your own or your loved one's future health care, Call Cypress Home Care Solutions at 602-264-8009. That's 602-264-8009. Or visit cypresshomecare.com. Be sure to join Health Futures with Bob Roth every Friday at noon, right here on Money Radio 1510 and 105.3 FM.